Welcome to episode number two of the Lean Musician podcast with me, Jack Vaughan. This interview with Ben Salisbury was actually done over a year ago. Before Lean Musician, I'd started another podcast for film composers and sound designers called The Sound of Media. Uh, And after a while, I found myself winding it down and forming a new project with Tom, uh, which is a slightly broader podcast and now platform for musicians, obviously, Lean Musician. I know Ben from a project a few years back, and he's a big composer on the Bristol scene where I live. He's very prolific and has been involved in some very interesting projects, as you'll hear. It's a great interview and one of those ones I really didn't want to let go into the dusty archives of my computer. I hope you enjoy it, and please remember to head over to the show notes at leanmusician.com slash episode two. That's episode and then the number two. You'll be able to find all links and uh, things mentioned in the episode. Okay, here's Ben. If you could just give us a, a kind of an idea of who you are and what you're up to at the moment. Uh, Well, my name is Ben Salisbury. Um, I am a a composer for film, television, um, and I also do bits and pieces with uh, band projects and things like that. Um, At the moment, I'm just finishing off the score for a film, a movie, uh, with a guy called Jeff Barrow, um, who's uh, best known for his band, Porter's Head, and I've I've also got an album coming out, um, which is completely away from the film and TV side of things, with a guy called Scott Hendy, uh, going under the name of Dolman, and that will be out in June. So those have been the two things that have been occupying my time recently, um, and they're both, uh, yeah, both sort of drawing to a conclusion, which is a nice place yeah. to be in. And then there's other things coming up. Uh, later on in the year, but I'm um, looking forward to a bit of a break, to be honest. Oh, is it absolutely? Yeah, it, it's sort of the it's the funny life, isn't it, of a, a film composer and producer? It's kind of freelance that you do have these. Do you find that you have these kind of big gaps and, or <clears throat> not in a in a bad sense, but just in a in terms of the rhythm of your work? What do you, what yes. do you experience? Yeah, that is definitely something you have to get used to. Um, the the sort of big projects do tend to come in spaced luckily spaced out I mean it's horrible when things uh, overlap or when you have to turn things down I, I have literally just turned down the, probably the, the biggest thing I was ever uh, ever been asked to do which I, I can't really talk about wow. but because yeah. it um, it clashed with the, the, the film I'm doing and um, <clears throat> it's a terrible mistake I think to, to to take on too much and to do two jobs badly you know do the do the do the one you're Absolutely. concentrate on the one you're yeah. working on, um, and that does sometimes mean you have to turn down things uh, that you would really like to do. But um, you're probably better off in the long run in making sure the quality of your work is, is you know, you, you keep producing stuff that you're proud of yeah. rather than um, ever sort of doing things slightly substandardly. Absolutely, um, and presumably as well enjoying it. As well. And enjoying it, yeah. And there is a work-life balance thing to 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 think of as well. And I've got two young children and, you know, right. you do sometimes have to come up for air and yeah. um, uh, that's very important. Uh, but but equally, the, the downtime between big projects, um, I think it's, it is also very important to just keep ticking over as well with... I mean, there's obviously, you know, this, this slightly boring stuff of marketing and, and meeting clients and all of that sort of thing, which mm. I don't, I'm don't. i terrible at and don't do much on. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, luckily I've got some agents that sort of take care of that side of things. But I think the most important thing for any composer or anyone working in the music industry is to just keep doing interesting things. So if yeah. you've just done a... So whenever I've just done a big natural history series or something like that, and there might be a break in between, I'll you know go on holiday or have some yeah, time off, awesome. but then come back into the studio and do very different things. And that's how, actually how the the album I've just done with um, Scott Hendy uh, came about because we both we play football together and Absolutely. We, we he just you know had some ideas and came over and we just had some fun with things. And there out of that comes a whole new musical project um which has been great fun to work on and might lead in off in another on another tangent um, yeah. so I, I you know i always think that if you if you just concentrate on being a film or tv composer a it gets a bit boring to in my <laughs> mind uh, but b you're not you're not stretching you're not spreading i mean it's very Completely. Yeah. i found it very difficult being typecast as a as a natural 
Natural History composer, and, right. and Natural History has been, been right. superb for me, and yeah. I love doing it, and I've done some amazing, I've been You've really, really fortunate. A lot to, as well, yeah. Yeah, and very fortunate to work on, you know, I can't ever complain about working on big series, you know, David Attenborough series, The Life of Mammals, Life in the Undergrowth, yeah. Life of Cold Blood, are just, they're, they're always going to yeah. be there, you know, and there's, there's, there's very few opportunities in, in TV uh, to work on things that are going to stand the test of time, but but equally, I, I actually got into the composing game to do dramas, really, that was where, what I mm. wanted to do, and, and sort of fell into natural history because of my location uh, and knowing people in the natural history and my mm. dad used to work in the natural history so I grew up knowing the, the natural history world mm. um, which definitely helped um, and uh, I understood the genre very well And um, uh, but I've, I've desperately wanted to do more dramas which I am starting to do now but I found that very, it's very difficult to, to sort of cross that divide of being sort of typecast as a as a natural history composer, mm. and, and musically as well, hugely different. Yeah, hugely different. yes, and and can you I'm, mention some of the dramas that you've done and the scores for them? Uh, well, um, the I did a the, the first sort of good drama I did uh, actually was at college, and that was, it was for a guy called Miguel Sapochnik, and I did his first short film, um, and then he he went on to be a, a bit of a superstar. He, that his first, it, that actually was my very first TV credit was um, a, a student film that won the British Short Film Festival, the student category of the Short Is Film Festival. Is that online anywhere? Is there anywhere people can listen God, to it? you know, I don't know. Um, if they were to search through a I'm keyword. pretty sure if they looked up The Dreamer, uh, no, that was his second one. The first one he did was called Going Home. I right. don't know. I really don't know. Well, if, um, I, if I find it, I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and then, then, then he then went on to direct adverts and... Stuff. And then he came back to me about three years after we'd left college and said, you know, I've got another short film Great. called The Dreamer. Um, do you want to do it? And I was in the middle of doing a natural history job. And this is, was one of the few times where <laughs> I'm contradicting what I said earlier, but I just thought, right, I've really got to try and do something for this, even though I'm doing something for the, for the BBC. And I just abandoned the BBC project for <laughs> a few days, for a week, and just, just did this thing. And that, that then went on to be very successful in sort of Hollywood circles and got eventually got Miguel his his first feature film job um, which he wanted me to to to, to well, he put me up for doing the music for but because he was a first time director mm-hmm. um, he, he he couldn't really he didn't really have much say and I, I wasn't expecting anything uh, and that was a film called Repo Men which unfortunately didn't didn't do very well at the box office although it was majorly messed around with by studios and and is actually a really it's got a lot going for it as a film um uh and he's now doing big hollywood um tv series and actually it was uh, when i was talking about the job i had to turn turn down or turn down being put up for at least it was one of it was something he's he's doing mm. uh, which is a great big um you know massive 13 part Hollywood TV right. series um, uh, so you know that that's been one opening into to getting into drama and the other one has been to go going back to what I was saying earlier about working with other people and and doing different things in between the, the natural history stuff um, is is my is through my collaborations with uh, well there's this Scott Hendy collaboration mm-hmm. I talked about which at the moment is just an album but um, the other collaboration person I've collaborated with a lot is Jeff Barrow, mm. and um, so we that that was another avenue into drama, and I am actually doing a feature film with him at the moment that we're just finishing finishing off, um, and and that's you know come about through again I've known Jeff for a long time, we've wanted to work with each other for a while um, when Alex Garland was doing Dread, uh, which was a feature film, uh, yeah a few years a couple of years ago now yeah. he spoke to Jeff because he know, knew that Jeff was a someone a mutual friend told him that Jeff was a fan of Judge Dredd and they got meeting and Jeff said oh, I'd like to work with this guy Ben and, and we, we started coming up with um, ideas for the film and actually got quite far got quite involved and uh, was working with, with working with Alex and mm. seen a cut of the film and you know it was really going well actually the, the creative team at DNA Films who were making it, you know, loved what we were doing. But there was a, 
a slight issue with the financiers basically wanting to take a different approach with the film that Jeff and me to be fair I mean I'm a commercial composer so I probably if I'd been on my own might have been willing to to sort of bend my ideals but it's actually mm. sort of really interesting lesson that I learned from, yeah, from Jeff it, is that, well um, it, you know I, I can't go into absolute details sure. but it was a it was you know and it happens all the time in the film industry which I've learned more and more about but there's a you know a clash of ideals and the, the one one side wanted one approach another mm-hmm. side wanted a different approach and there's you can either you can either bend your will and and um, you know appease the the financiers or the people who have perfectly you know they're, they're perfectly justifiable uh, reasons of course um, but equally you know we had a very strong idea for the music for dread um, and to suddenly just abandon that and 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 toe the line that makes it sound terrible but to suddenly um, change direction for us really wouldn't have been worth it and and uh, creatively and so the, the best thing was to just you know sort of mutually mm. agree to um, sever ties with the film um, which it was was absolutely fine to be honest um, uh, we we kept our material mm-hmm. um, uh, turned it into an album um, called uh, Drock. Uh, we, yeah. we then we we developed the material and extended it and wrote some more stuff as well. Um, the film uh, got in a new composer, a guy called uh, Paul Leonard Morgan, who did a good job in in you know uh, took um, you know Alex obviously had uh, had been influenced by what we we did, so he was able to. There was a certain type of music that we. Um, well, there was a, the, the the dread score had a a sort of two headed vibe when we were doing it, which one was this sort of very carpenter esque synth, very purist right. uh, synth stuff, and the other was this sort of slow mo um, pull stretch, which is a free yeah. Just started using it. Yeah, it's yeah. great. It's, it's brilliant. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we used that um, on the film uh, and introduced that to Alex, and then and so it was nice that when the film. Finally, you know, when we finally went to see the film mm-hmm. in its finished form, that had stayed in the film, and Paul uh, Leonard Morgan had used that very well, really uh, nicely over some of the um, slow mo scenes in the film. So, you know, we still we still felt we had a uh, you know a slightly yeah we still felt we were part of of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, we got a thank you at the end in the credits, and it was you know, and I I really wished the film well, and I think it did did very well, you know. It, did well in the box office in Britain and um, slightly less well in in America, but it's 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 generally been deemed a, a success for Alex. And, yeah. that, and what what was and so it was very good that we were able to keep our relationship strong with Alex and and you know um, uh, and that's uh, you know it's, it's gone gone on from there. So it really it really interests me the the fact that I mean you're you're classically trained. You've been playing piano since you were. Five or something like that. I read. Uh, yes, I have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and yet yeah, also you've got this other strain, which is very sound design savvy, and kind of how does that play out in general of your scores? I know you obviously you've done a load of natural history, and it's it's really lovely to do both, but kind of your approach to composition, mm. and both from a kind of composer traditional classical standpoint and also a sound design standpoint. Is, tell me about a bit about that. You know, and I think that's the interplay. really no. I think that's a really interesting question, and it's uh, it's almost it's funny having sort of two heads. <laughs> My work with Jeff and and Scott, and I'm learning this all the time. You know, working with people from that other side of the of the musical world. You know, someone like Jeff and Scott, in, uh, both those two in particular, are just incredibly, their, their brain is organised in a different musical way and I'm <laughs> really trying to tap into that because it's not about, it's not about complicated, clever harmonic progressions or, um, you know, they, they can come into it, but that isn't important. It's, it's all about the the actual sound you're producing and and what how that resonates and mm-hmm. what that means and the and the and the context the his, sort of historical context of that sound and um they sound like a film composer yeah don't they you know <laughs> well, no but they really you, you know they and it's a, it's it's a brilliant way to think about things because i think you can as someone from a sort of classical background you can 
over musicalize things or you can use sort of harmon and I think we all do it we use sort of harmonic tricks or you know that I find myself falling into that mm -hmm. very much so you know or here's a here's a sunrise okay well I know that a modulation from here to here and mm -hmm. whatever that's gonna and you you fall you fall back so if you if you sort of take that out of the equation and, and that doesn't really matter that's uh, you have to find another way to to bring about the emotions and it's almost like a sort of purer, more minimalist approach to things and it's, uh, I find it absolutely, I found it absolutely fascinating working with Jeff on this this stuff and working with Scott on the albums and working mm. with Jeff on the Drock stuff um, and you know, it, it's almost restraining it, it's actually quite easy to do most of the sort of standard film music -y tricks, you know, it's one thing me and Jeff have been really, really uh, sort of looking out for on this film we're working for at the moment and that's uh, you know and I'm not saying we, we haven't done some of them some of them are <laughs> some of them are, are, are standard tricks because they really work and you know you have to it's, it's that old adage about the, the, the cliche you know yeah. um, but it's 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 really interesting actively trying to find another way to to do things to not do things in a in a standard way um you know whether people will pick up on that in the score i don't know you know there are you know it's, i'm not saying we're trying to and and the the funny thing is is the film we're working on we can't change the world with it we can't it's not that sort of film it's not like under the skin at the moment for so example can you explain a bit more what you mean by changing the world with the score isn't well um and, and i don't think you can ever change the world with the score no, you can change the yeah i mean i think um uh, i haven't seen the film yet but i've listened to the score for under the skin um and and something like that is a very bold obviously um non-standard approach and that's you know you if you listen to that and compare that to what me and jeff have done mm -hmm, on, mm -hmm. on this new film you know, it's leagues apart. We're working on a much more commercial, commercially minded film. Mm -hmm. But e but even so, we're trying not to do things in the in the standard in the standard way. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'd, I'd, I'd be interested to know when it comes out and when the you know it's yeah, always absolutely. been a, a slight battle. Um, the, the the producer on it, but we've had some really <clears> good people <throat> behind it. The producer on the film is a guy called Scott Rudin. Who is um, he's just uh, well? He's probably the one of the most powerful guys in Hollywood at the moment. Actually, I mean, his if, if his record, you know, you look at his credit, you know, he's he's one. He's one of the few people to have won an Oscar and an Emmy and a Tony and a Grammy and a whatever. You know, right. he's, he's he did the Social Network and the King's Speech and blah blah. Just loads and like No Country for Old Men and um, you know, I might have got some of those wrong, but he's his his uh, his track record is is you know, beyond anyone else working in the industry really um and so when he says things you listen to them you know it's not like yeah. uh, some of the executives you come across who who seem to just sort of jump in and say something because they want their voice to be heard and show how powerful they are he, he uh, but he really loves the, the sort of more alternative the nature of our school right. yeah um he's always been a champion of of um slightly alternative scores he loved johnny greenwood's score for um there will be blood um and he's been you know he's been very supportive of what we've been doing in this film as well so um you know that uh there is definitely room and there is definitely an appetite for for people and i think that's something that's happening more and more in the film industry people people yeah. from you know and someone from jeff's background brings that you know, I, yeah. I, yeah, definitely. I wouldn't be able to do these scores on my own, or I wouldn't be able to do them. I wouldn't. I would. I'd hopefully be able to do them, but I wouldn't be able to do them in the same way. And, mm -hmm. and um, that's fantastic to be able to have that. You know, that that's sort of help and that yeah. side of, of it's collaborations and and bringing bringing freshness to the table is it's yeah. just so important. It's and it's so easy as composers and well anyone who works kind of on a on a, on a DAW yeah. To, yeah. to just break out and work with someone and get some fresh ears because you can get so insular about what it is that you're doing, you know? Mm. Um, you mentioned something a second ago about the standard way of writing for things or what you'd expect and things mm. like that. And it's interesting hearing that. I mean it seems, you know, really contemporary and not out there but kind of your you're pushing your own boundaries, if if not other people's, you know, yeah. with, with what you're doing with Jock and um, and the scores that you're doing with Jeff. But 
it's, it seems really interesting hearing about that and then thinking about that you've done like 50 plus films for yeah. natural history. Yeah. And when I listen to natural history, yeah. that's, that's what, generally speaking, when I listen to those scores, I go, oh, that's the standard way, or yeah. that's the standard No, score. and so, they're, they're, so they're, it's, that is again a very interesting thing, and it's something I am really grappling with at the moment, actually, um, in my head, just because I've been asked to do a couple of natural history things later on in the year, and they are asking for, oh, it would be lovely to do something you know, contemporary and fresh and a bit different. And, and do they really and, mean and, that? And, and <laughs> yes, do they really mean And there is nothing worse than than someone's, you know, than a, than a sort of pseudo-contemporary and fresh. What you actually get there <laughs> is the music for Cash in the Attic, or do you know what I mean? Not to belittle the music for Cash in the Attic, but you get, you get, you get a sort of holiday programme approach where you just get a bit of electric guitar here and a bit of... And there's nothing... There's nothing funky or contemporary or out there about using electric guitar. In f- and so I'm, I am actually grappling with this because I don't, I don't know the answer. And I've got a meeting with a, with a guy soon uh, to talk about this. And I, there, there's part of me that thinks, actually, the, the best natural history scores... Um, there's nothing, think, there's nothing wrong with doing, with, with doing things in a, in a sort of stand, in a standard way in a sort of classically um, elegant, um, you know, a Barnaby Taylor, every time he does a natural history score, I just think, you know, that's classy. Yeah, know? absolutely. And, and, and yeah. That's, uh, that, that actually probably is what natural history programmes, a lot of them, should be. They should be classy. They should stand out as, as really, really well-made, um, uh, really elegant, really beautiful, really expensive, really luxuriant, really, you know, that's, that's, and as soon as you start, you know, there was one on last night called Monkey Planet or something, and it, and it used, it used almost entirely, um, I only caught the end of it, but it used entirely sort of found music, you know, Mm -hmm. and tracks from all over the place, and, and, you know, are you saying library music? Well, not library, I think some of it was library music, some of it was, was found music, um, I'd have to watch the. It'd be an interesting program to watch and yeah, I'll link just, to it. Um, because my from the watching the last twenty minutes of it, I thought it cheapened the program. This is just my opinion, and sure. I'll probably get in trouble for saying it. I probably know the people who made who made who made the program, but it, I think you know it, there's an uh, it, that's what everyone does. Mm. So mm. I, I realise <clears> I'm, I'm in a sort of tricky place. On one hand, I'm saying you know. Music should we should try and you know uh, not do the standard thing in, in but mm. on the other hand I'm thinking when well, natural history films actually uh, there there is something quite classy about doing the standard thing in in a natural film and there is a grammar that people understand and love uh, I think there's been a problem with that grammar I think there's been a sort of overblown nature mm-hmm. and I've been guilty of that myself definitely. Um, and it makes me wince, and it's a, it's sort of a problem with uh, programs having an orchestral budget and producers and composers getting overexcited, for want of a better word, about mm. the fact that there's an orchestra at their disposal, right. and and uh, forget actually forgetting what the music's for. Now, an orchestra exactly this yeah. totally this is this is a huge thing that I spoke about actually in the introductory podcast, which is right. just the direction. It's so easy as composers and sound designers to forget mm. what it is that you are doing and not so much that you're like a slave or anything like that it's not going the, to the opposite extreme but you are sort of in service for want of another phrase yeah. you know for for what it is that you're doing and and that it sort of ties again with what you're saying a minute ago about our approach as composers particularly as classical uh, or classically trained composers yeah and i think it's about the way that we think or that we uh, hear music and I think there's different levels or different ways of hearing music like you mentioned the kind of the technical or the maybe the, for want of another phrase again the literate kind of way of listening to it which is probably a really pompous way of putting it but no. someone who really has read scores and understands mm. the quotes language of, yeah. of, of classical and of particularly orchestral music and then there's this other background which may be a, a just a feeling the sound which is why I've entitled the podcast as it is yeah Um, because I remember, I don't know whether you remember this, but when I was younger and I, I mean, my first two albums, right, that I absolutely loved when I was about seven years old was Hanson 
and the <laughs> prodigy. <laughs> and I had no yes. distinction between no. them. It was the it was Firestarter and Umbop or whatever it was that right. was yeah. And they were both amazing. I remember listening to them both and just like going into another world of just absolutely loving the music. And yeah. when the Spice Girls first came out, I remember just loving it. Yeah. And then later on I got all cool and all that stuff. Yeah. And and I and I didn't. And yeah, okay, fine. That's, <laughs> that's putting it a bit too simplistic. I'm no, not saying no, that they yeah, are best, but but I was no. listening in a different way. And I think absolutely. as composers, I have certainly I think a lot of people lose sight of of the sound of your score rather yeah. than the score itself. I mean when someone who hasn't studied music listens to your show or whatever it is that you they get the visceral they get the 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 surface level the kind of the sound of hmm. and we're talking about the sound of natural history and how you kind of yeah i mean i mean yeah i don't really have a question i'm sort of just no no it. it's all it's, it's all absolutely true and um it, yeah and it does does all tie into to what i was saying about working with jeff and working with scott in that they come from a they they come from a a, a different background where the sound is everything um and that's you know i think that goes back to what i was saying earlier is how how sort of interesting that's been and sort of crucial to my development of working with them you know mm. and you can always you know, that's the other thing you're always learning things as a composer you know um, yeah uh and and you're absolutely right and 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 that ties in with the the thing that i've found has been problematic with natural history scores and that I've been a part of um, it is this sort of overblown nature um, where people you 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 have forgotten this thing that you're talking about, which is the the sound. You know that this is this has got a job to do. This mm. music and and just because you've got an orchestra there and you can uh, and and it's not always it's not in fact it's 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 definitely not always the composer's fault. You know you get producers who who have never. Been to an orchestral scoring session, and and you know you get uh, you've got Abbey Road booked and eighty musicians, and it's all very very exciting. And they just want you know bigger, louder, bigger. Mm. Can we have cannons? You know. Can and we when have... you say they want this, is this after they hear the score, or when they hear your mock-ups? Or... Yeah, I mean it, all the way through, and it's it's a sort of there's a there's lots of things going on that lead to this sort of perfect storm of getting it wrong, um, <laughs> uh, which is producers not trusting. Producers and executives not trusting that their footage does the does the right thing, that their story is strong enough, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, and no one's saying, no, actually, this this really is strong. You don't have to have um, cannons going off in order to to make everyone realise this is a big moment. And, yeah. and in fact, if you if you do that, you'll kill it. It's right. overblown, and it's that uh, you notice the music too much. Um, and then, you know, there are times where you really do want to be swept away and, you know, the big orchestral thing is great. And, you know, it's, it's a tricky one. And I, I haven't, I, I'm, as I said earlier on, I'm sort of going through a, uh, a bit of a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with it in my head as to what is the approach, especially when you're getting uh, producers now saying they want, they don't want, you know, they don't want the sort of George Fenton-esque um, Blue Planet Standard that has been which defines so much, which has been the sort of which has been the sort of standard for for those big blue chip series right. and has worked incredibly well and you know uh, and I've been a sort of sub part of that um, as well. Uh, <laughs> That's I, a nice way to define yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I just I, I'm not I don't I hope I don't do things in the same way that you know, this isn't and again not to belittle George Fenton because you know some of his stuff is uh, incredible but I don't I just don't have the same um, uh, I don't write in the same way, the same way so I'll never I'll never well I mean he defined so much didn't he so yeah. in a sense to be like it is 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 going to be less isn't mm. it I mean mm. someone has to come first and and often when people you know afterwards when people emulate that it is yeah the well weirdly I I feel a little pang of guilt. In, in the, everything I'm saying does, it, I reckon you could trace back to um, to a series I did called Congo, where, where it was the first big orchestral thing I did, and and the the producer wanted a really big cinematic John Barry esque thing. Right. Um, but the thing there was, and the way I would justify that is that he had a the the, the producer Brian Lee had a an absolute sort of vision. That that's how he wanted it to be. He wanted it to be out of Africa. He wanted it to be this very sort of 
cinematic approach. And I think that's the same with the Blue Planet mm -hmm. um, uh, and the uh, Planet Earth. And, you know, they, they, they've obviously gone for this sort of coffee table cinematic approach in the where, where it grates I suppose is where where they haven't really thought it through but they've got the money for an orchestra and it's um, and it's let's just pile everything in and um, suddenly you're getting you know uh, this overblown music for for sequences that really don't warrant it or would be much better off with something simple and restrained and um, and this is I mean so one of the things that I was really impressed with is, is that quote from Attenborough about one of your scores what was it for it was um, just saying that it's not dominating yeah that was but, that was and that's a I mean that's wonderful I mean that's yeah that's quote brilliant. you can get yeah, no, he, he, that was brilliant actually I mean that. he said you you were one of the what was it I've got it here one of the I think this is one of the best scores that has been on any program I've narrated doing exactly what one hopes music will do in the circumstances evoking atmosphere enhancing drama delighting the ear yet not dominating the picture I mean that's it you made it um, yeah you've done yeah, it well, <laughs> that was all nice. downhill from there oh, yeah, that was that was fun he, he wrote that on a handwritten letter that um, uh, uh, that I received after he'd, he'd done his narration for the it was I think it was program three of um, life of mammals and um, and he, he just uh, he wrote that letter and then he, the next time I saw him he spoke to me about it and he was just you know where did you find that drummer and he's really into his you know he's really into his music is he? Uh, yeah yeah he's very he's very he's, he's a great pianist you know he's, no uh, way oh yeah I didn't, know. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know enough about him I know it's quite intimidating wow. um, <laughs> he, he's always catching me out actually he did for um, what was it he said uh, what was it Life Life in the Undergrowth um, uh, I, I wrote the I co-wrote the score for the series with um, a guy called David Paul. Oh yeah. Uh, and uh, but I wrote the the title sequence for it, and um, so David came up uh, when we were watching it one time. He said, "Which one of you wrote the?" I said, "Oh yeah, I did." They said, "Oh yes, you um, you've obviously uh, listened to Schoenberg's um, uh, <laughs> uh, something or or something." I said, uh, I know, I know. Sorry, David. I sort of know. I, I yeah, I went to university. I remember who Schoenberg. I've heard of Schoenberg. Yeah. <laughs> he did the twelve team stuff, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, they, no, no, that melody is definitely. Uh, you and I was like, oh, 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 yes, okay, yes, yeah, well, of course, mate. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, but he, so he's he, he's fantastic to work for on that. And that letter that he sent me, you're absolutely right. That is, you know, I'm obviously very proud of that. And I that that should that program. That particular program on that series is probably uh, is as far as I for stuff I've done um, where is, is an occasion where I just about hopefully got it right and these are, this is something sometimes fluke when you get it right you know definitely uh, and it was a case of we had an orchestra we recorded some orchestral bits I had I was working with Dan Jones I hadn't mm -hmm. done that much orchestral stuff and so I was working with Dan Jones mm -hmm. who'd done lots and he helped me out and um, had some great people help me with helping me with, with orchestration and stuff like that so that that really helped but we also I realized for that program it needed that particular episode it needed something else as well and so I got this guy Dirk Campbell to play uh, Duduk and, uh, and a got a percussionist called Paul Clarvis to play percussion so I had these other elements that weren't orchestral and, and we could we we did a whole section which was literally just uh, just percussion um just these these you know it's about a 10 minute section uh, and it was a sort of challenge and it was because the the producer Vanessa Berlowitz had I think she'd cut the sequence to that um left field track you know that was used on the Guinness adverts right uh, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, dun, and it was great dun, dun, yeah dun. <laughs> and it was great it was obviously way out of keeping with with um um you know a sort of a standard natural history thing and I just thought well why don't we just you know that, what's driving that is literally this rhythm why don't we go even further and just right. make the whole we'll just right. um, do the whole and, and and so I think that's what made that successful was actually not over using the orchestra in a in a sort of for for the power of the orchestra when it was necessary and coloration and right and so you said the orchestra it. so how did you orchestrate that I mean uh, you said just percussion but well in, in that piece there was no I, there was no orchestra in right it, you know so it was right. it was it was um it, it was just 
it, although we had the option to use an orchestra, I mm -hmm. said, well, let's not. Let's do this whole 10 minute sequence right. with no orchestra. Uh, and that's some, you know, there's some producers you work with would go, no, no, we've got this fantastic thing yeah, at our disposal. Exactly, let's use yeah. it ever, everywhere. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting an thing. And, it's, and it's an in, in, it was interesting that of all the programs in that um, series, Life of Mammals, that was the one that David sort of picked out as being, being his, the one that he liked the most. And, and, and I think if I look back on it, that was the one where we were most restrained with our, right. you know, and, right. and more considerate uh, exactly. in the way we use things. So it's just about being considerate and being a bit, bit braver um, and uh, not not getting overexcited about the, the toys at your disposal. You and know? it's so easy. And thinking it? about program, you know, really mm -hmm. thinking about uh, you know the the music and the picture rather mm -hmm. than just the music, and that's much easier said than done for everyone concerned because they get very ex you know you can get very excited mm. by um, but sometimes just one hell note through a whole sequence is right. is more yeah. is more effective than you know um, I I'm a bit I think it's is it Jeff Pierce the guy who did Gravity I've forgotten his name I can't remember uh, Stephen. Price, Price, that's yeah. it. Jeff Pierce, who's Jeff Pierce? Oh, I don't know. I have no idea. I've got that name in my head. Um, uh, but um, Stephen, yeah, he he was saying about how I've forgotten the director's name, but it, he he went to him with a cue, which is like three minutes long, and he'd already been through this whole like long process of saying, mm -hmm. you know, of paring the score down, refining it, not saying mm -hmm. too much, and not doing any composition, exactly the kind of stuff we're talking about. And he did, I think it was like three minutes of C major or something like that. And he, and he went to the director thinking, right, this has got, there cannot be any more that, and apparently the director said kind of, um, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, bitty, you know, like, it's a bit, it's a bit too detailed. You yeah. know? And it, and it does happen. And I mean, I'm interested in, in when you sit down to quote compose, mm. how do you do it? I mean, do you sit, what's the general starting point for a, for a, and, and how do you find the quotes, the sound, you know? Um, it depends. I think is the is the honest answer. I think there's different depending on the the type of music you're doing, the type of score you're doing. With the film I'm doing with Jeff, it, it's been very much me and him sat in a room um, with with a sort of idea in our heads that might have come from me or might have come from Jeff, and then then literally trying to sort of coax it out of these. Oh, we've been using you know analog synths and, and um, sounds that we've made ourselves by sort of pull stretching again brass fragments that I've found and really and then um, you know so that 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 is almost like a sculptural process in some ways like mm -hmm. we've got this block of clay that is the idea and then you just sort of chipping away and and i have a tendency to over musicalize things and jeff will come in and I, if i've been left to my own device and go wow what have you done there you know take that out take that out and I'm like, oh yeah you're right yeah right um and so that is it's and been is a, a true is collaborative as well yeah yeah it's been an tr absolutely true collaborative process it's been really really good on that front you know um we've had our sort of you know slight differences in the way we approach things and and um and then it's it's a, and and also it's a, it's a battle the director is very hands on um with what he wants as well so we've been you know it's been a real solid three way process and that's been very different i suppose and, and the question about how do i sit down and Sometimes writing on my own is, is similar to that, and I'm sure anyone who writes music will know the same thing. It's sort of a vague idea. You sit down at the piano, you sculpt away, you, mm -hmm. you craft, you you know, there's a lot more sort of um, hands-on work involved than just sort of suddenly getting inspiration. Right. But I do think at other times, especially uh, sort of tune-related things, weirdly, any uh, melodic things, I, I do often get... Um, you know, out and about, mm. um, <laughs> driving the car somewhere, or you know, uh, um, the Congo series I talked about earlier, and they needed this big John Barry esque theme, uh, and they kept on saying, you know, come on, please come up with something that's like out of Africa or whatever. And I, you know, it's just one of those things that if you sit down and go, okay, right, I'm going to do out of Africa, <laughs> it just doesn't, yeah, it just doesn't work. And then I was I was playing football or something, and I was driving home and. I just, just uh, sort of thought the tune and quickly uh, stopped, got my phone out and sang into right. it. And, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and that's uh, if anyone found my phone and went through the 
uh, voice memos, it would be the most embarrassing thing ever. It's sort of me going, yeah, 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 you know, humming vague melodies and going, bass comes in there, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> so there is quite a lot of that, and I, I do enjoy sort of walking to, uh, you know, I work a 10 minute walk away from here, so I, I walk to work, and, and that's a good, you know, literally just to think things and try and hear stuff in your head and then get in the studio and, and recreate it. So, uh, you know, I think that, and there's, so so stepping out of the studio um, and actually thinking about what you're trying to do. Um, but I think like anyone who writes music, you some, the other way is, is that you have just this vague, uh, intangible idea about what something should be, you know, um, and it might not even be musically led. It might right. just be, oh, this should just start with, a single tone that grows and what what have you and you have no no there's no other nothing more solid than that and then sure. you sit down and try and make that work i mean yeah. I'd, I'd i'd be fascinated if you get you know if you ask that question to everyone you interview and see what yeah. they say you know yeah I, I don't know sure i don't know what the answer is i don't know what i, I know that some days you you incredibly chuffed with yourself and you think god i've done amazing and yeah. other days you spent a whole day and you just think christ that is terrible right um um, and sometimes you get that wrong, you know, sometimes you get your judgment wrong. I think one of the key things... You mean you come back the next day and it's actually good? Yeah, right. you come back the next day and it's actually bad, you know. Oh, the, right. the, next day, <laughs> the next day test is a very, very good one. Sure. And the listening with someone else in the mm. room, you know, playing it to my wife and saying, what do you think of this? And suddenly you're hearing it through their yeah. ears is a very good one. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, I think there is a... There's a a tendency to to not step back. You know, I find that, and, and you just get stuck in, and you sometimes really have to so, step yeah. back and, and um, taking breaks and taking like breaks that. and and um, yeah. Um, I've recently gone into doing the. Uh, it's a fancy title, the Pomodoro technique. No, Have you ever heard of it? No, it's a silly no. title. It's very simple. It doesn't need that. But it's um, it's uh, it's basically twenty five minutes working, five minutes break, or or just less than right. five minutes, and you just get up out of the room go and do something else, stretch, come back. Yeah. And that on a kind of just on a micro scale is just, it's, it's really, really helpful for, um, but I think it's, it's that tipping point with it. I quite often find myself just getting to a point of like, you know, six, after six hours working on something mm. and I'm just like absolutely nothing. And then the next day you come back and you realize that all of that rubbish was, was worth doing. Was worth doing. All you have to do is take out like two lines or like, Reorchestrate that bit. Yeah. Take out the the melody that you thought was amazing, or the unison that was just making it so awesome yesterday, yeah. and you actually get something that is kind of sort of the the other face of what you were trying to compose, which yeah. is so much better. Well, I th I I I think that you're you're absolutely right, and I think that over half, maybe even three quarters of the ability to write a half decent bit of music is not about being able to write a half decent bit of music. It is about being able to judge what is a half decent bit of music, whether it, that you in your own work, it's being able to judge what is what is working and what isn't. Right. And, and that's that's again something that people like Scott Hendy and Jeff Barrow and all those these people who work in the in that that world uh, are so good at. You know, it's what Jeff is so good at. He'll just go, yeah, that's great. And you'll go, is it? And you'll go, no, yeah, that's really good. That's really heavy. That's really and 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 you'll and. And you'll be, uh, and, you know, a few days later, you'll be, yeah, uh, you're, you're <laughs> right. You know, it's having that, it's, it, judgment is everything. Judgment and sort of taste, for want of a better word. And, um, I don't know, when you, when you actually nail something, you, you go, God, that's it. That's it. We've, um, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, it's, you know, having gut instincts and all of those sort of things. Um, mm -hmm. doing things wrong, uh, is important. Um, but knowing when you've done them wrong, um, and then just as you said, you know, listening through to something and being able to sort of savagely cut it apart or take it apart, mm. don't don't get too precious with it. Um, so, is there any advice that you have for people for getting those fresh ears? Um, play it to other people. Uh, yeah, definitely sit in a room, well, you know what, and play it to your nearest and dearest, even if you don't trust their opinion or you don't want their opinion. Right, yeah. What you get is you get a, um, you, you suddenly step out of yourself. Right, totally, yeah. And you think, oh God, uh, that's a bit rubbish, isn't it? Um, <laughs> oh God, I'm a bit embarrassed of that. Or you go, it's weird, isn't it? Yeah, that's cool. You know, you yeah. uh, and you, re you can only do that when there's someone else in the room. So do that. Um, <laughs> uh, 
ha yeah, do, do the, the first thing in the morning thing, I think is, is absolutely crucial that, you know, sit down, play yourself what you've done the day before, first thing in the morning. Do, do, the, do the sort of fresh, the fresh ears things on yourself. You know, sometimes I, you know, from working late, go to the pub, <laughs> have a pint, come right. home, have, have a listen again, you know, yeah. that step away from it. Um, get drunk is what you're yeah, saying. Get drunk, <laughs> yeah, always. That's sort of, would be my advice to anyone. Um, um, yeah, um, and there's a weird thing that I, I get, I'd be interested to know whether anyone else gets this, is, is at the end of the day, if I've gone, I've, I've sort of gone, no, got nowhere with something, um, and I've got to get home, and I've got to pick up the kids from school or whatever, I've got, you know, I've got half an hour to go, and I just go, oh, sod it, right, okay, blah, blah, blah. that's actually quite good. You know, totally abandon what I've been doing. If, if it's not working, I just think... You mean oh, just throw stuff down? On just, the, throw, yeah. just throw something down as a, as a sort of wild, last-minute um, sort of emergency... Um, and that's often worked for me. Now that might just be a, a personal thing, but that has, is, is surprisingly yeah. the number of things right. that have happened when after you... a day of, of getting nowhere, bashing my head against a brick wall, uh, thinking everything I'm doing is rubbish, and then just finally going, well, what actually? And I think you have to you have to have gone down that road of 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 yeah. of, of it not being the right approach mm -hmm. and suddenly you just might you know it literally might just be a piano in front of you and you just play a little it's like oh god there's there's some legs in that oh that's really good oh no I've got to go okay shut the computer off and then it's in your head as you're walking home and, and the idea might develop overnight and you're excited to get in the next day and and you, you look at it and go yeah you're right that was a good idea and there yeah. you go you're off on a, on a and that that has happened to me loads of times um, as a I wouldn't it's kind of I would record, and you can't sort of plan that as a way of working but it's surprising how often that has happened you kind of have to get to a point where emotionally almost you let you can let go of yeah. of, tr of of trying or having to be good because yes. that's so easy to sit down and kind of feel on a very subconscious level right I must be a good composer or this, yeah. must, this must sound sophisticated and yada yeah, yada yeah, absolutely. all that stuff yeah. I have a, a friend um Get the, he'd be kind of writing sort of three bars a day or something right. like that. I mean, like huge score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, three or four bars a day, maybe. No, no, no. What was it? It was about ten seconds. That was, right. like, was crazy. Of course, yeah. um, and uh, and he, he he said that kind of at the end of every day, he'd only stop when he got to a bit of music that he was really excited about. Right. So he'd get to this point where he was finding this new sound or this next bit, and then he'd stop after about five minutes of writing that. So that he was excited for the next morning. And That's fresh. I can I can sort of understand that. Yeah, it's it's the nicest feeling. So you believe in the world. like it's going to go away. You feel like oh no. Oh, yeah, crap, it's is, the best feeling. Yeah. You know, in terms of you know enjoying your job, it, when you when you wake up and you think, God, oh, I've got that. Absolutely, I've got that really great thing. I've, I've, been, I've got that great thing to get yeah. stuck into. You know, yeah. I was really into that. Um, so yeah, um, I've never really sort of um, thought about that in as much detail, but it's definitely and whether you can. You know, as I say, whether you can actually plan for that, I don't know. But it's uh, it's a, it's a, it's definitely a Brilliant. good way of, of looking at things. Yeah. Cool. Well, we should probably wrap up. But yes, um, okay. what's coming up for you? Um, uh, well, there's this, the, the, there's this some album. things you can't talk about. Uh, as well. the, the, the film. <laughs> um, which we will be able to talk about very soon. Where will people be able to find out about that in, um, in the future? It will be on my website or um, what's that? Is that? That's be, um, what is my website? BenSalisbury uk i think great uh and uh um that's that's gonna be great we're, we're really into that me and jeff it's gonna be it's a great film um so yeah i'm sure that will be out in the open soon as to what that is um, yeah. um and then there's this dolman album which would be great if um you know uh if people like it um the first video that is is just out yesterday two Brilliant. days ago uh so if you if anyone does a search for i'll link for, i'll link to it as well yeah, yeah that'd be great it's it's great um yeah we really, really i'm really into that um as a video and as a track I've got some brilliant vocals done for that by a guy called danny from cry baby his band is um so there's that and then after me and jeff have got this weird video game awesome. thing in in the pipelines which which uh it sounds incredible. It sounds almost, it's almost too much to get your head around. It's like a three year project. And, wow. And, uh, God knows what, it, what it'll what it actually morph into, but it, it sounds really, really exciting. It's like a new, it's like a new frontier of, of, mm. of sort of 
mad creative ideas. You know, the, 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 they're going through the roof, these sort of new way of looking at, at um, computer games. So there's that. Um, and I just think that's, I think it's really important for anyone doing music is to try and vary it up a bit. I mean, I know it is for me, maybe it's not for other people, but I just love being able to dip into, you know, um, the thing I did for the Beyonce documentary was very sort of classical. Yeah, you were talking in, about that, I know. In, no, but that was not, you know, that was, uh, you know, again, different for me because it was working with Americans and working with Beyonce, which is obviously very different for, uh, well, wow. I didn't really get, I only met her at the end, it was quite weird, but right. uh, uh, I did, you know, she did have to oversee everything and, you know, commented on everything I did, so it was, I was sort of, um, what was actually she working with her. Get any good quotes out of it? <laughs> uh, yeah, she was very, very complimentary, actually. She was, she, the, the main thing she did was just say, uh, all right, can I trust, tr you know, I, I can trust you now, Ben, to get on, you know, I've played the, she heard really? the first three cues and I was like, all right, trust you and get on with it. Um, right. uh, so that, but that was very classical orientated with an orchestra and a piano and, a, and this is, is very electronic stuff I'm doing with Jeff and, the band stuff is really, it's, it's really, I'm just really enjoying it. I'm really enjoying doing Sounds completely brilliant. different yeah. things, you know. Keeps um, everything open and fresh. And yeah, just absolutely. Just forming you absolutely. as a composer. Cool. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, Thanks so much, Ben. No problem. Appreciate it. No problem at all. Yeah. Okay, hope you enjoyed that interview with Ben Salisbury. Quite a long one. I hope the recording was right. Do uh, let me know at the show notes, leanmusician.com slash episode two. And see you next time.